let's do it again. It's Kate Wheeler Felcher from me and the Howdy. Virginians. Howdy. We're Come here. On. Welcome to the Art Agents. All right, I tried to wing it today. Thought it was so professional, uh, setting it all up and missed the button. All right, please forgive. And we're going to talk about Frank Frazetta today. Now, Frank Frazetta had great agency. And that's the real, the whole big ethos of this show is how do we look after ourselves as artists? And because and, nobody's looking after us. We think we are. We might get a job in a business, but they can fire you at any point, And now you're back in the wilderness again. So we're going to talk about how two working class lads like me and Frank could possibly navigate such a crazy world of art with no idea at all of how to get work. And yet we wanted to do this for our, our livelihood. And that's why people thought we were crazy. You know, I talk to any working class family. I want to be an artist. It's like saying I want to go to the moon as an astronaut and you haven't finished uh, year five. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like <laughs> they believe you have to have great qualifications when all you really need is the passport and the passport is a great portfolio. And that's what Frank had. So how was he and I, and I'm going to stand in for Frank. Imagine I'm Frank, the boldness of it. Uh, but I feel I know Frank well enough and his history well enough to answer questions on his behalf. And if I can't, then I will say so. But please think of it like that. And let's have a look at this cool guy, Frank Frazetta. Here he is in the He's 1950s. Cool. Wow. Could you be any cooler? We always yeah. think when we see these old people shuffling around the shopping centers and stuff. Go, oh, look at that old person. They were the hippies of the 60s. They were flower power. And before <laughs> that, they were on these Harley Davidsons. You know, you just don't, you don't realize just how cool these generations were. And they were tougher. They had to be. And you got to be tough today in a different way, which is psychologically. Back then, they were tough with their fists. So here's Frank in the 1950s. Now, I'm believing that he owns this amazing motorbike, which would have cost a fortune for a working class man, on the paycheck of Al Cap. So one of the things he did to find agency in his own work is he ghosted for Al Cap. Now, Al Cap was one of the biggest names in newspaper syndication. And back then, comic books always paid terribly, and they still do today. But what paid our king's ransom? And just ironically, was King's syndication, King's features, they were called. And that was a newspaper syndication. And every time you got your newspaper, that would be the funny papers. And you would hand over them over to your kids and the kids would read the comics. But keep them quiet. And that was King's features. And if you got a strip in there, which Al Cap had, it was called Lil Ab Abner. Lil Abner was successful beyond belief. They made movies out of it. And Al Cap was fabulously rich on that. But he didn't want to draw Al Cap forever. And so he ghosted it. And what ghost means is another artist draws it and the original creator signs it. And you can imagine Frank Frazetta being so proud, how much that must have hurt every week as the best of all the Al Cap strips were Frank Frazetta's. The, by a long shot. I mean, there was nobody as good as him. And Al Cap was terrified of losing it, I'm sure. Because the second he would have to pick the pencil up again, the strip would just drop in quality like nobody could believe. And you would go, what just happened? And he said to Frank, we're giving you half a wage. And Frank walked. And that was the day Frank really found agency. Because he how, walked how old was he when that happened, Patrick? Well, Frank, now you caught me on the hop there. I would say, you can see him here in the 50s. I'd say he's in his 30s. So at that point, he's got a family. And that is a big call. So he's got a family, he's got a house, and he's walked out of a steady paycheck. But during that steady paycheck, he did some of his greatest work. He did some of his most beautiful work on the side because the agency he had with that strip was that he only took one day on it. And then he had four more days when he wasn't goofing off playing baseball and stuff to really hone his craft, and he did. So he was doing stuff like, let's have a look here. That's the Canaveral stuff from the 60s. That was some of my favorite stuff right there. That's 10 years later, almost, because it's within that decade. So he walked from Al Cap in 62, I think. And this, is there a date on it? No, I'd say this, there is. Oh, this is 73. This is a good bit further on. There's been three decades of Frank Frazetta and their peak moments, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And they were absolutely fabulous times for different reasons. So during the 50s, he's ghosting for 
Al Cap. Uh, Al Cap, and then doing like just random freelance stuff. How is he finding those jobs? Yeah, that's a good question. How is he finding? Yeah, them? yeah. <laughs> He was friends with a bunch of people that were just fantastic. There was Al Williamson and a bunch of other guys, and they were called the Fleagles and Roy Crinkle. So these Roy Crinkle and Al Williamson were the two much two most char colorful char characters. And here's Frank from that era. Look at how muscular he was. So he would pose for all his his own paintings. In fact, there's a werewolf drawing, if I can find it. He always said Frank didn't use any reference. He had 50 cameras. So we got to understand there's reason for 50 cameras in your house. But I believe that he only just glanced at the reference because his drawings were, or his paintings were just too fluid. But everyone needs a little bit of reference if you're going to bring realism into the mix. So if we find the, the werewolf, you can actually see, I can match that against it. So let's have a, a rumble through here and see if the werewolf pops up. So we're running through these Frazettas as well. And there's Came the Dawn. So Came the Dawn was the end of the 60s, I think, or something. No, the end of the 50s, this would have been. Is there any dates on it? Just before. Oh, you... my goodness. It wasn't that awful. <laughs> What's the date on that? I th there's no date on it, but it's the 50s. Oh, okay. There's no doubt oh, about okay. it. So this was the end of, and you know how you said, oh, my God. Yeah, this was the end of the 50s and it was the end of comic books because of these kind of comics and so there was a book published called the seduction of the innocents and it was the beginning of huge censorship with comic book artists but there was the ec comics tales of terror and everything and they become became so gruesome that like you say the parents would look at that and go oh my god it was worse <laughs> it was much worse yeah i'm sure and they created a code and the code basically destroyed the entire market because kids uh, love gore. They love gruesome. But they have no yeah. idea of mortality. So that was what really made Frank and everyone absolutely poor. And they were they were walking around going, what next? What are we going to do? The censors? <laughs> the censors, yeah. They created a comics code. And the comics had to have a little ring on them that said approved by the comics code. So yeah. this, this code really didn't mean anything. It, but people were terrified of it. And so Marvel had it. If you look at any Marvel comic from that, those days, it'll say approved by the comics code. So you wow. know you're in for a tame ride. You know yeah. you're going to get killed. There's no, not going to be any drugs or anything like that. And then e eerie comics and creepy comics came along. And they just did a simple thing. They went for adults. <laughs> so here's Frank and Al Williamson on a roof. And this is for, as far as I can see, <laughs> that actual drawing. Do you see that? Yeah, that's yeah. a pretty funny picture to have like <laughs> you and your friend like hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> like... Use reference, didn't you? You're just having fun. Yeah. This looks yeah, very yeah. similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Weird. Yeah, that's just a funny enough? picture to have, I guess. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so they're definitely using reference. I'm going to open this one because this is another moment. Frank didn't start painting in oils till he was in his thirties. So anyway, I always laugh when students say, oh, I've missed the boat on 24. Mm. It's the baby. Just take the little pacifier out. You haven't started drawing yet. And so Frank didn't start painting until he was in his 30s. So why was he sort of good at painting? Because he was brilliant at drawing. Yeah, the inking. There's the inking he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> think about the inking, how fearless that makes you, because there's no, there's no real room for error. You, there is some. You have to paste it out with white little bottle of white stuff you know it's horrible you couldn't really draw on top of it after that so it was pretty much merciless but what it means is you had to be really great at drawing and when the drawing is perfect you put the ink on top look at the flow of this tiger right here tiger creature for me this was the moment when frank changed the world not the conan this one beyond the farthest star i hope there's a date on it but it would be the 60s. So this would come on the end. So Frank had to do all kinds of work after Al Cap, stuff he didn't want to do. He did work for men's magazines that was considered shoddy, sold onto the counter, and you know, never show anyone that work again. <laughs> yeah. today, by today's standards, it was so tame. It really was. It was sexy girls with very tight costumes on, you know, <laughs> doing their stocking up. Oh yeah, I'm sure he got some weird ones coming to him sometimes. <laughs> oh, he did. 
Yeah. But the thing with Frank is, there's a funny picture of him somewhere. When he went into those offices, this was another moment of agency. When he went into one of the offices, I think the model hadn't turned up or something. And they said to Frank, we're doing these saucy book covers. We need a model to be in bed with this this model here, this woman. And Frank said, I'll do it. You know, <laughs> what's the pay? So there's a picture of Frank and he's drawing. I'm going to get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all this, so he gets all his gear off and he's sitting yeah. under photographing him. And of course, Ellie has no clue. That's why. Yeah. You know, that smiling over his shoulder, you know? Yeah. He does a few of them. And that was one of those moments of agency where you go, oh, anyone else would just go, oh, that's tough. A model didn't turn up. Hope you had good luck with that. Frank says, I'll take my shirt off. So there's a moment <laughs> he's going, always thinking about how do I create work for myself? And how do I see an opportunity and just take it right then? There is an ink of something like this too, isn't there? The ink. Well, when you get something as powerful as this, what you find, yeah. you recreate. It's like nature. You know, I was just talking about it yesterday. When I, here's my agency. I'm creating a a bunch of movies about fantasy drawing for for beginners. It's been asked for so many times. Releasing the idea right here on the podcast. So that's what I'm doing. And what I do is I carry on with that idea and probably blow it out too much until it becomes too complicated. I think this this point here is too complicated for beginners. And yet I've just drawn this beautiful thing. And so my agency then was, well, I'm not going to throw this beautiful stuff away. I'll put it over here. Now, what will I do with that? And I thought to myself, well, I've just made the book, The Power of Osmosis. And I'm still running on that idea. And it links back to this, by the way. I'm still running on that idea of gestural structures. And that's what these are. And so now I'm creating two batches of movies at the same time. Fantasy Art for Beginners and The Power of Osmosis movie collection. And that's an organic thing. So that came from something that happened during the process. So that's what Frank's doing there. And during that that idea, I was talking about nature, how it replicates a success. So we've got biceps here, right? And we got triceps here. And if you go to the legs, it's reversed. We have biceps on the back and triceps on the front. Here we have an ulna and two epicondyles. And on the knee, we have a patella and two epicondyles from the femur bone, which is now replacing the humerus bone. So there you go. So <laughs> nature, nature repeats itself when it has a success. And that's what this is. This is repeating itself because it's a success, but you have to change it a lot so people don't call you a hack. So a hack is someone that just repeats something verbatim and never changes it. Yeah, like you kind of become like kind of cringe. Like it, somehow, like Frazetta never went that way. Like he was very conscious of it. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow he managed to avoid that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He didn't want to repeat himself. He said it often. Yeah, because, you kind of become like a parody of yourself. But you can take these ideas here and make something fresh from them every single time. I mean, see the shadow across that beast? This would be half the art if it wasn't for that shadow because it shows that he's coming out of the forest. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, we all know how gritty is it in anatomy. There's that moment there of the epicondyles right there and the ulna coming down like this. You know, he really knew his anatomy. And that was another thing, all these flexors. He really knew his anatomy enough to do this and find, you know, those triceps. He was just fantastic at all this stuff. He really knew it. So what made him a great painter? was being a great drafts person, a great designer. So he drew for ages in these funny comics. Like he did little comic animals and stuff. And that's animation art. And so look at the animation of all these figures all the time. He's so aware of it. You know, he's working to a deadline. So I would have killed that tangent right into his face and dropped that arm down to here. But you can only do so much. And that's why he kept going in and changing the pictures because he would have seen that too, lightning fast. But look at all this stuff to come. This is watercolor and gouache, and yet it looks like oils. So he was organically transitioning in the oils. When I first saw that, I thought it was oils, but it's not. Yeah, I thought that was. Doesn't it look like it? Yeah. But it should be oils, because that would have been a much easier ride for him. So he was using this as a gateway into oils. And that, for me, is the big moment there. And I'm going to take a, a guess at that of being 64, 1964, just a guess. And the reason I'm guessing that is he lost the LCAP job in 62. 
was totally out in the wilderness doing all these men's magazines. And then Roy Crinkle, his friend, who was getting loads of work, said to the publishers of, let's say, is that Ace? Said the publishers of Ace, I've got another artist that can take some of this load off me. It's called Frank Bezzetta. And they said, oh, we've seen his stuff. It's really old fashioned. We don't want him. Can you believe that? Frank Bezzetta, <laughs> you don't want him. So they got him to do a test. And he did a test and he said, okay. But they always didn't want him. It's beyond belief today. They didn't want him the whole time he was working there. A smaller company called Lancer came along and offered Frank mo way more money to do their books. And he left Ace right away. Now, before I'm going to open it up to questions if there's anyone out there asking questions. And I just wanted to show another link between the watercolor period and what was coming next. And the paintings would never have been as dynamic if, if it wasn't for those 20, let's say 20 years of drawing because he was a professional artist at 16 20 years of drawing right so he's had this uh well let's think about that 30 20 he'd be 36 right so 20 years of drawing and now he's going to start painting out of the blue out of nowhere he sees this opportunity that roy crinkle's given him and he has only painted in water watercolors to this point and so he adds a bit of gouache to it which is a thicker white that is, it definitely is a gateway because i used to use it myself but it's so feeble. You know, it cracks and breaks and everything. I'd never use it again. But the likes of James Gurney uses casing, which is based on, on uh, gouache, and he does beautiful things with it. So it's a wonderful medium, I think, for color roughs. But the, the thing is that oil paintings, regardless of why, are still the most expensive paintings in the world. It's just got this gravitas that goes back to Rembrandt. And so people just go, well, that's what it's worth. And we have to understand now that painting, some paintings are now currency. And so we have Frank Frazetta. Now think about this. This is another part of the agency. Frank Frazetta was the first artist after a generation. I don't know what happened because pre Frazetta, way back to the times of uh, Blind Decker, they were getting their artwork back and they were getting royalties. And then somewhere along the line, Artists got more and more frightened of the publishers and the publishers just took their work and never give it back to them and sometimes burned it. In fact, often just burned it. When they could give burned it back it. to the artist, it was too much trouble to give it back. And so they just burn it. And so imagine that. And Frank took a pay cut. He says, I'll, I'll do it for half pay, but I own the art. And that was a big moment for everyone because everyone yeah. saw that that worked. And they went, well, I want my artwork back too. And we have horror stories of Jack Kirby and the likes of those comic book artists never got their art back and could have made fortune on the, you know, on the secondary market of uh, selling your original art. And so there's there's Frank with Sylvester Stallone there, come along for Sylvester mm -hmm. to buy some big paintings. Another thing is provenance. So the minute that Frank, that Sylvester Stallone bought a Frank Frazetta artwork, that elevated Frank Frazetta's artwork into the stratosphere. So provenance is this. If someone famous owns your artwork, one of your artworks, you're, you're immediately worth more. And that yeah. artwork itself is worth more too because of the hands it's been in. That's called provenance. So anyone that buys the Sylvester Stallone artwork that he bought has to pay it, pay more for it because it was owned by Sylvester Stallone. Now, yeah. that's provenance and that's agency. So Frank got his artworks back said, give me $25 instead of 50. Think of that. Instead of 50, give me $25. And one of those drawings became one of the most famous comic book pieces of all time. I'll put this up after the live stream. Sold for $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars in his lifetime, right? Now, a quarter of a million dollars made Frank rich because a quarter of a million dollars, let's say even 20 years ago, it's a million dollars today for what you can buy with it. So yeah. there we go. He turned on 25 and made a quarter of a million dollars. That's agency. So that's one of the big... How old do you think he was when he was seeing that kind of money? Very late on in his life. Very yeah. late. <laughs> but I'm glad you brought it up, Rachel, because there was a time in his early life, in his 20s, would you believe, when he could have had that money and he was ripped off. And that's why we have to... And probably that pain, because you have to have a bit of pain, that pain... <laughs> It must have made him bitter for a lifetime ago, never again. And what it was, because we were talking about Hal Foster. So this was Frank Frazetta's hero, Hal Foster, right there, right? 
So Health Foster created a an amazing, fantastic. Do I have to get the giant book out? Should I? He was the king. <laughs> that shell. Oh God, I have to bend over. Oh, you have to <laughs> bend over like a Go. like a weirdo. <laughs> Like we need like an intro for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so big. it's so the big. It's the cabinet of curiosity. Oh my god, <laughs> that is a big book. It's so big that I had to put it underneath my, my um, cabinet because yeah. there's no room for it in the cabinet. Well, and you said big book. I yeah, that's know. the biggest gonna... book I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the biggest book ever printed on an illustrator. Yeah. Where do they expect you to put that book? <laughs> <laughs> you don't make bookcases big enough. Yeah. <laughs> well we created this that is so crazy. and it is famous for probably the most detailed panel and that's only one panel because if i if i pull this out it's one panel of a page and that's the hill foster guy that's Hal Foster. Hal Foster. See that? Prince Valiant. Yeah. So. That's super cool. You can see why Frank revered Hal Foster. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, I like all those guys. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, there's wow. so many guys. <laughs> there's so many guys. Now, you have to be a great artist to be able to draw like that. Yeah. So, why? how could he take the time to do that? Because Hal Foster had a syndication with King's Features. So King's Features back then, you had comic books, which meant poverty, and you had newspaper strips, which meant you were in the money. And so Hal Foster was working for King Features and doing the, the Prince Valiant strip, made him fabulously wealthy because it was syndicated to not just one magazine, one, one newspaper like the Times, or it was all the newspapers. Everyone got Prince Valiant's, Valiant in their newspaper. And it made him fabulously rich. Now, he must have had a business sense because he had ownership, copyright of those artworks. And every contract I sign, I own the copyright. So that's my agency. Now, look at this beautiful little rough. I'm going to open it up to questions. If anyone has a question based on all of that agency we just talked about, how do you guys navigate this world and make it your own? Let's we see. do have a couple of questions, Patrick. Yeah, we got some good questions. So Leo Gehrman asks, uh, can you see agency over artwork changing with the advent of generative AI models? Your oh favorite boy. question. Yeah. Oh boy. oh boy. Who threw that grenade? Leo yeah. Gehrman? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no doubt it's changed. There's no doubt at all. So I feel like copyright's kind of gonna go away. <laughs> but we still have we still have that class action from Carla Ortez. Yeah, I hope that they do something there. <laughs> I'm rooting for them. Yeah, I'm glad least, someone with a name yeah, behind them. She's a real yeah. hero. We'll have to get her on if we can. Now, hopefully, in the future, we'll get a better deal, and then AI will be our friend because they're doing some fabulous stuff with it. It is quite terrifying. But it's taken away those entry level positions. I used to make money. Can you believe this is another one of my my agencies? Was I said to myself, I walked all the way around town, and here's a sad story for you. I walked all the way around town with little business cards because I couldn't afford to get them printed, right? So I made every one of them. Every one of them was an individual business card, <laughs> and I stamped on it like this. Jeez my addresses right yeah they're all laid out on a, on a table and then i airbrushed every single one of them with color like that and then i had a stack of about 60 of them and i took them around the agencies in belfast you know what the hell just went through the yellow pages and i give people these business cards and i said i airbrush you can see some of the airbrushing on this this card i said it's not it's not like an actual airbrush not re reproduced. I said, yeah, it's actual. He says, that's really nice. You know, you'd see the, uh, that there was no run on it and that it was very nicely gradated. So my airbrush skills were right there on the card. And he says, show me some more of those cards. And I showed him some other ones. He says, you never, you never missed a beat, did you? You got them all and never once a drop or a spit. I said, no, I'm very good at airbrushing. Now, the sad story is I went out into the rain and they started to run. 
because it was it was ink. Oh, uh, no. yeah. I just stick them up my coat. And now I've got a coat <laughs> with, with color on my coat, right? So I'm walking through these this rainy street with color draining through my coat. And then I, I pulled them out and the wind took about 50, 20 of them or so, like that. Oh All no. The streets, right? <laughs> yeah. That's that was my life back then. But <laughs> I got I got back to my studio, which is a, a shop above my dad's thing. I found out there was a grant for like Rachel, we were looking at grants recently now. There was a grant, an artist can do this, and it was called the Prince's Trust. And it was Prince Charles, the king, the new <laughs> king. He put up a trust for se severely deprived young people, which was me. Right, <laughs> very deprived. You know, I had to. Yeah, take you're like I'm qualified. <laughs> and that would be me. You're talking yeah, about that. I've been waiting for my moment. <laughs> yeah, it's not that big moment. Came. And so they yeah. went. Well, you, you live in this terrible place, and you've got no money. And no, have you only got one pair of shoes? Is that a hole in them? So they didn't do that, but that's what the idea was. And so they said, well, if you can prove that you can start a business and put money in this bank account. And show us some clients, you can have this trust. But there's huge competition. And I went into a room and there's like a hundred people there. And the guy says, This time next year, 99% of you will have failed. Right? So they were real just tough people back then. But I got the grant. I got it. And so I started this. And a guy called me back from Lockheed. Uh, it was an advertising agency had a Lockheed contract. Now Lockheed is an aircraft company that was built in in Belfast and they were a really big company. And if you'd not heard of them, you, you might've done, you know, that they're still- Yeah, you've heard of them. You've heard of them. <laughs> yeah. And this guy said, cause you know that terrible rain I was talking about? Yeah. He had been filming, listen to this for just coincidence. He'd been filming the aircrafts that week that I was out there with the wind blowing my cards around, right? And he must've clicked me being so good with the airbrush. He says, you come in last week and we've got these giant photographs and they're unusable because the background is so miserable that we couldn't sell these aircrafts to Saudi Arabia with this horrible black sky. Can you airbrush us a lovely Mediterranean sky? <laughs> yeah. And I, just, I always said yes. I said yes. I the, the sort of jobs you get can be so random sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And, and they brought in giant photographs and they laid them out of my little... I was embarrassed coming up to the studio because it's just bare floors, right? There was nothing on it. It was like peeling wallpaper and stuff. It was just an old, like a disused mansion that drug people go into. That was my studio. And they came in and they went, this is authentic, isn't it? And uh, they were really nice. <laughs> and I I had never, I says, can I have two of these? He says, yeah, okay. Because I wanted to practice on one. And the first one I practiced on, I had to cut with a scalpel, this film. And I would cut it so precisely and then pull the film off. And I wanted to test that none of the emulsion would come off the photograph. And on the first one, I noticed that the knife scored a little light line all the way along because the emulsion is so fine. And so, you know what it's like when you scratch a photo and it, it, you can sort of see white on it. Maybe you don't. Yeah. It's a long time since photographs I actually handed one to someone. Yeah. And I thought this is a task. And so I did another test on it and got it to perfection, to perfection and pulled that film off and airbrushed the most beautiful sky. And this guy came in and he said, wow. He says, how much is that going to cost for more of those? Because I hadn't even done a price for them yet. I says, well, let's call that one. Uh, this is another buddy agency that I had then. I says, let's call that one gratis if you give me the other 10. And he says, that's really nice of you. What do the other 10 cost? And I give him a huge figure. So really, I was getting paid gigantically for the first one too. He says, yeah. you're, he says you're expensive. But you're worth it. And I'm going to tell everyone that you're worth it. Because no one has ever cut without scoring <laughs> the emulsion. Yeah. And so I, that was my new job, was just airbrushing skies. Now, today, yeah. do that on a computer in a second. So there was a time when you said the new AI back then was Photoshop. You go, there goes all my work. It's all gone. They could still hire me to do it on computer, but they're not going to pay me that gigantic fee that I asked for in those old days because he can give it to the studio guy and he'll do it for nothing. He'll do it for his paycheck. Mm -hmm. So we've had that, right? It's already been here before. And then I went, you know what? I was already bored with it anyway. 
I really was. I was totally bored with it. And they sort of pulled me out of a rut. They pulled me out. and Because I imagine if I did that for the rest of my life, I'd be really grim. Pulled me out of a rut. And I started working on comic books instead and really loved it. Huge pay drop, but I had money now. So that's yeah. what I, my agencies, I always get a, a paying job and then use that money to fund another thing that's my project. And yeah, you don't get money for that for a long time. And then you get all the money. So the agency is you hold on to your original artwork, you keep the copyright, and you start finding the agency to sell your own stuff. Or maybe make some movies like I do, make some books, and have that as a secondary, a tertiary uh, income. And they might be little incomes, but all together they make one big income. And that's the thing. Yeah. So AI is a problem, but so is Photoshop. Now, what can you do that AI can't? That's what you've got to say. So here's, yeah. Frank, here's Frank doing his men's. I hope that answered the question. I know it seems a bit brutal and everything, but honestly, yeah. it's, not, it's not the first time this has happened. It is the yeah. biggest, it's the biggest rumble, but it's not the first time. I, I think the parts that make humans more human are going to be more important as this stuff develops more and more. People are going to get bored of it and oh boy, look well, you for already, something else. Yeah, you can, like, you can already see it, can't you? you can it's going to work beautifully for those businessmen out there who just like they just think the artist is some sort of machine that just magically yep. makes stuff and barely pay them and just expect them to to, to crank work out yeah it's gonna work beautifully for for those people yep. but but i think that because they don't treat them like humans to start with that's right but but uh, i i think the parts that that you know come from you more is going to be more like what makes you stand out not exactly. not necessarily like making like the like best detail, most realistic yeah. thing. I don't think people are going to care about that as much. Well, they'll care, they'll care less for it. And yeah, I already see it, at least in my little yeah. world. <laughs> well, you can, you know, when you see AI art, you go, oh, it's AI, AI art. And it yeah. might be brilliant, but you still go, it's AI art. And so there's something human in, well, there is, we're humans. There's the human heart that goes, another human didn't do that. And that's a huge drop in interest. A human, yeah. mm -hmm, right? And so take this one. Here's another one of Frank's paintings. Now, at this point, Frank has, always gets his paintings back. So he did this one uh, for Carl Wagner, as Carl Wagner was an author. A Molly Hatchet. Molly Hatchet cover. So <laughs> yeah. there's another thing. Once you own your artwork, Frank was able to sell this to Molly Hatchet again for the ah. reproduction rights. Now, he doesn't sell the artwork to him. He still holds the artwork. Yeah. You can reproduce this for an album cover, now pay me. And I do this all the time. I do re reproductive rights for uh, lots of books. And so there's another little small, and that's a very, very small income, but it's an income. But what's brilliant about it is it's real advertising. Yeah. This phony advertising where someone says, if you take a thing out in our book, we'll make sure that a hundred people see that. And then nobody sees it. Everybody sees Molly Hatchet on the covers. And now yeah, he's- that's, that's one of the first ones I ever saw. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So, so now Frank's got another bit of income and a huge new audience that are dying to see. What so what did he paint this for originally? This was for Carl Wagner, one of Carl Wagner's books. It was a novel. And so it was a book cover. And then he kept the painting and then resold it for Molly Hatchet later? Two resales. Or... Yeah. Okay. So first of all, he reproduced posters. And that's a secondary income. Now, that's a big income because he gets 100% of that. Because they're his posters, right? So there's where Ellie's wife comes into the picture. So Ellie produces the posters. Not a poster agency who takes a giant cut. Ellie herself. So they made a fortune print in posters, the Frazettas. Now Frank's got his own museum based on the posters and all this stuff. And at the same time, now he's selling the repo rights to an art book. Where Peacock Press re released it. I don't have it there at the minute. He owns the copyright. Peacock Press have to give him a percentage of the books. Now they've got five incomes from one idea of just keeping the original artwork as copyright to yourself. And is that the end of it? No. <laughs> this painting is now that's this is just hot off the press because I just saw it in the flash the other day. I went, what? Is that true? Just sold for eight million, as far as I know. Now you might go, Patrick, that's wrong. I swore <laughs> I saw that the other day. It's that's not crazy. Yeah, it's it's crazy. not what I wouldn't expect because yeah. the queen sold for five and a half million. So yeah. it's so only, only go up.
Is this the highest priced one now? Then I think there's a ten. That's million the case. One. Okay. I think there's, but it's all <laughs> we don't know because yeah, auctions that sell them. Sometimes the buyer doesn't want anybody to know. Sometimes the buyer doesn't want to know who anyone to know who they are. Oh, someone corrected. They said six point five on six point five. Yeah. Is that right? Thank you. Who was yeah. that? Uh, Ronald went wind. Thanks, yeah. Ronald. Thanks, Ronald. So there you go. So we're up another million. Now, so once you start going up another million, it just sounds like another digit, doesn't it? It's a million dollars. Yeah. A million dollars. No, that's in, no, I can't remember when the Egyptian queen sold, but when it sold for five and a half million, that's an illustration, which is considered lowbrow. That's an illustration that just sold for five and a half million. Now, Frank was lucky enough to see his painting of the destroyer sell for a million. So I'm so glad he lived long enough to see that he was worth a million dollars. I was really happy to see that happen to him. So there you go. Now we've got paintings from illustrators worth millions of dollars. And that's brilliant. Uh, can you ask Ronald who the drummer is? Because he's the guy that, that destroyed that. Uh, he said Lars, whoever Lars. Lars, Lars, that's yeah. right, Lars. Go on, yeah. Lars. Two yeah. thumbs up for Lars. <laughs> well, you got the fireworks. <laughs> yeah, Lars, Lars give them the old scare to me. So this is the snowman. So Frank is 16 when he walks in the door. 16-year-old Frank. So 16 years old. And Frank's drawing professionally. And this is why it was so great. Look at that already, straight out of the box. Look at that motion right there. Look at that motion here and there. And look at that little leg. It's almost a Frank Brazetta leg already. See these little funny animals? This is where I got my start too. If you really think there's no work out there, AI is not producing funny animals. It just mm -hmm. can't do it. It can't do it. Can't do it. So well, I first went out and I thought, where is the company that will hire someone straight out of the box? Reading card companies. They're so desperate for people. They advertise still for more people because they pay so badly. But if you're doing little funny animals like this guy here and you can bang him out like that and start really feeling that rhythm, I would turn that head from here. Once you start getting that rhythm going, you can do these little funny animals and just like Frank did, have a paycheck for one day that'll fuel the rest of your week. And now you can start to do other things. Now it's a small paycheck. I remember what I was getting for the greeting cards was a hundred pounds a card. Hundred dollars I put in there so long ago. I was getting a hundred dollars or a hundred pounds a card, a greeting card. Now people working greeting cards weren't as fast as me because they didn't draw as well as me. So I drew really fast. I'm starting to sound like Frank. I told you I would. I'm <laughs> really fast. And so they tried to get me to work per hour. So why would I work per hour? I'll do 10 yeah. greeting cards. And you'll pay That's me. frustrating. You work so yeah. hard to get fast, and they're like, "Oh, see, so you get four done in a day." Yeah, I'm gonna like, get. No. Yeah, the same as this guy. <laughs> yeah, and there's he over here doing one card a week. Yeah, right. Yeah, it happened, pal. So that was my first agency as well. I went. No, I only pay. I get paid per piece. Now I learned that from my dad. He actually called it piece work. He was a plasterer, and he would walk in. I remember him seeing seeing him doing it, and I went, "That's impressive," because everyone else is working. I thought everyone worked. For a week, because you're a kid. I thought everyone worked for a wage for someone you don't see an invisible person in the sky. And my dad was working for himself, always working for someone. But he would walk in, and I remember being with him. I was 15, and I was his apprentice. And he would go, he would say, one, two, three, four, five rooms. And he says, okay, I'll give you a piece price for that, meaning an entire price for it. And the guy always took the price because what it was was my dad was fast. And his crew were fast. And so if he had to work per hour, he wouldn't have made as much money. And the company would have, it would have cost the company too much money to hire these lazy bumps. And so they hired the fastest, best guys at the highest price because it still was cheaper because they did it faster. So there was the agency right there that I brought in the greeting cards. I said, no, it's a hundred pounds per card. They went, that's outrageous, a hundred pounds per card. Now you might go, well, it's only a hundred pounds. It was. They're making a squillion dollars off of it. Yeah. They're still selling them today. If I walk into a green card company <laughs> or a uh, shop in Australia, I walked into a green card shop in Australia because I get I, I get so bored in the shopping centers. I go where any art is and I go and look <laughs> at the green cards. And I was looking at the green cards and I thought, I really like love the composition of this. This is really nice. This person's special. The color, yes, the depth of it. You know, this is really nice. And then this huge 
warmth of nostalgia come over me. And I went, I did it. I did this. And I had forgotten. It was 30 years ago. And I was doing so many of them. I painted this. They're still selling to this day. And I had to look twice. I went, where's my... And I had a little signature I used to hide because you weren't supposed to sign it. Just to hide it in the trunk of a tree or something. Just <laughs> yeah. to me, I went, I did, I did, I did. <laughs> so I did so many of them. That's right here. He's doing so much of it that by the time he got to painting, he was fearless because he knew how everything moved, how everything works. So greeting cards. I got a hundred pounds per, per card and that would fuel me for the week because I had just come off a building site where I got a hundred pounds a week. So I knew what slave labor was. Because I, I was in it. I was in the slave labor market. <laughs> and how beautiful it was for me to paint funny little cartoons and be, still be clean at the end of the day and not exhausted. So there's where Frank started. He started with the little funny animals. There's always work in funny animals. Right to the day, and hey, I can't do them. Just cute, happy things. <laughs> cute, happy things are always, in, they're always business. Yeah. Look at the energy in his little sketches. Oh, look at that. This is all coming off of the funny stuff, you know? This is all animation. And so anyone that can draw well can paint well. But anyone that can paint well can draw well. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't mean they can't learn to. But if you learn to draw well, you're going to paint like he did in his 30s and come out with this, right? So here's Frank trans transforming from watercolor and gouache into oils. And I think this was the first time we saw what was going to come. And this was for a creepy cover. So now I sell in reproduction rights to, to Warren publication who weren't paying much but he also had the agency to say no art direction now unheard of totally unheard of so yeah the breakdown of this for me would be we got this central figure right I'm just doing this as I see it but really for me the flow was here and someone a student asked me earlier about the golden ratio where you have basically all the detail in one third of the picture like that and it works like a treat it really does but I love Frank's idea of just a bellowing sort of smoke idea, you know, that brings us right through to anywhere. Now, that's really exciting because it's not based on a golden ratio. It's not based on anything else except for flow, right? How does it flow around? And you can really start to feel their, their leathery wings beat around. This is how I compose. I compose everything with a flow and see what feels right and bring it to somewhere and say, can I put a figure in there? and see what it looks like. And he did. Now he has to do, like I said, no art direction. He still has to leave this portion here to say creepy. So it's not like he hasn't, he, there's no rules, but he knows the rules. He's been doing this forever. He's been doing this for 30 years. He knows what to do and he can compose within that. And there's nothing, most compositions look pretty good with a bit of space near the top anyway. He can always chop that canvas off if he wants to at that point. So you have that, but beyond that, the no art direction. And it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not a mean thing. You're basically just saying, look, I, I have honed all these skills and I will give you the best piece of art you can possibly hope for as long as you let me do it. You do need an art director when you're young. When yeah. You know, they help you. They go, oh, that color's a bit brighter, this and that. But once you're in your 30s and 40s and you've made a reputation for yourself, really, it's a bit of ego from the art directors then. If they're really calling up someone like Frank Rosetta and telling them what to do, it's ego. It's to, to justify their paycheck. And the best art directors that I've ever had are so evergreen that they know that. And they go, Patrick got this nice little project for us, right? Collaboration with a big C. And, uh, and we'd see what you do. That is a great art director. We've already had a relationship and they know how it works. And we both end up applauding each other. Didn't we do a great job? Yeah. I'm supposed to be breaking this artwork though. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the time as well. Let's make sure we don't go too long. How are you, Rachel and Melanie, for a little bit longer? I mean, I can go. I'll, I'll sit here for forever. <laughs> yeah, it's like I gotta stop. go to work yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Should we, should we say? Tomorrow. Well, should we say half an hour? <laughs> okay, we can yeah, do that. Good. Okay, so I'll break this down. And why is it so great? Okay, so now at this point, Frank still isn't as full of powers yet as painting. So as you create a new medium like oil paints, like he's doing here, 
you're a little bit not i don't think he would be too fearful but you're a little bit hindered by the actual process of painting how fast is the oil dry all of that stuff you know he was always putting the oils in a in an oven to dry them so obviously he was working things off and to be honest that really doesn't dry in oil painting you know oil painting dries by oxidization so the heat will speed up possibly the evaporation of the spirits well it'll definitely do that and that's probably the reason why his paintings are cracking today so really at the end of the day I, th I think i heard a horror story where he delivered an artwork still wet and then he went back was it him anyway if it's not frank it's another artist he went back and, and the guy says have you got that artwork done he says i'll give it to you last week and the guy says oh i put it on the ledge to dry so he opened up the window and there was pigeon droppings all over Frank Frazetta's painting. Oh, no. Oh, no. The guy had forgotten. He must have the... really just been all over the place. You don't remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that's what those art directors are like. And that's why they were burning the artworks. They go, it's too much. The artwork, the artist wants it back. I throw in the bin. You know, I've got another project to do here. So Frank had to take a, a pay cut because he was annoying people. You know, they go, I, you know, is he in for that artwork? Then we have to store that somewhere for him to come back for it after it's reproduced. Well, yeah. You have to. And because of that agency, we all we all won from it. But like I say, somewhere along the line it was lost because Lime Decker, he was like, let's take Max Maxfield Parish. I feel like AI is just kind of like the tip of the like it's just the end result of this this thing that's been happening for a while oh. now. <laughs> yeah. It, like commercialization and just industrialization yeah. of the whole industry. <laughs> yeah. Well, making I, artists into machines <laughs> that's right well i think here's what i always do and i think this might be a super part how can we get silk out of this pig's ear if something terrible happens what is the good side of it what can we do with that and there's always the good side it's hard to believe is there a good side to ar exactly what we were talking about i believe that that painting that leonardo da vinci whether it's real or not is a half a billion dollars because the kind of people that can do that stuff are becoming less and less and less. And you're never going to get a half a billion dollars for a print. That is guaranteed. Now, I know that I think Leonardo Di DiCaprio bought a print of Metop Metropolis, an old silent movie, and there's only four of them in the world. There's scarcity there. And it's a yeah. it's a print that is, let's say, she's 100 years old now when you think about it. And it was in pristine condition. So there was provenance there. It was the first sci-fi movie really with a giant budget. It was the first iconic sci-fi movie poster. There's only four of them. And this was one of the original ones. So I think he, Leonardo DiCaprio bought that for $150,000 or something. That's a huge amount of money for a piece of paper yeah. printed on four color print. But the scarcity of it and the provenance of it were the reason for it. But it's not a half a billion dollars. Yeah, and I think that'll be more important. Like, some I was thinking about getting into later this year is like woodblock printing. Yes, they're great because yeah, that 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 seems like a fun avenue, and and I, and it's something. Every single one is different, and there's still a human, you know, a very human element to all that. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. Go. I think go, like, I, I want to go more in that direction. Like I talking to Steve Houston, he's like, you see everyone going one way, he goes the other way. Well, the, well, and, uh, every, and, I, and everyone do that. That was popular. Look at the Beatles, you know. Look at yeah. uh, David Bowie. Always the same thing. Yeah, that's already that's already moving. Now, what are we gonna do next? Now, that's a great light bulb idea right there. Look at the agency yeah. that Chill just brought to the show. There. <laughs> Lino Cut is one of the most beautiful and organic looking things and every one is a little bit different from the other and so you can lino cut a whole series of posters and each one is regarded as an original and you sign it now is the lino cut the wood or is it something else well you've got lino lino cut is it's kind of a pulp okay you know, you know the stuff that you see on floors masonite has a bit of a shine to it yeah well, it's like that you know lino uh okay i don't know if they still sell it but when i was a kid it, everyone yeah. had it in their homes it was i haven't done my research yet i just saw that word and i didn't know yeah. what it meant <laughs> you have to get a whole bunch of tools but the tools are so cheap they're so yeah cheap. i did i did one woodblock printing project in high school one time and i liked it yeah so i just never did it again though <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna love lino because what lino is okay it's softer and it gives you more control what okay. i would recommend is don't try and control it too much 
I have a friend called Lee Crocker from years and years ago, and he did lino cuts, and they were so gorgeous, you know. And once you block that thing down, bloop, and you leave that big black thing on the on the page, there's nothing else like it. You smell the ink; it's just gorgeous. You get that on some pulp-free, uh, some acid-free paper, and do some lino cuts, and create scarcity with this. One of ten, one of a hundred, something yeah. like. Once you do that, you are selling original artworks. Yeah. Then you have to burn. You have to burn the lino. You have to destroy <laughs> it. And you have to destroy it. Oh yeah, because you don't want anyone else to get it. Oh, oh I no, no, no! To prove that you're not going to do another lino cut. Oh, to prove that it's yeah. an original lino of only hundred printed. And maybe. Maybe you could like put in some resin or something. I don't know. <laughs> you don't want to burn. Like you it. don't want to burn yeah. that lino cut, do you? Yeah, I'm gonna do something to it. <laughs> Well, then what you can do is you can do various prints. So there's your, your agency again. You can go, okay, this is one of 100, right? And then you do one of 10 with a marquee, a remarquee. So what that is, is now what you do is you do 10 more lino cuts and you do a little small drawing at the bottom and they sell mm. 20 times the price. And Frank Frazetta, once again, all ahead of us would sell in the poster business. He would sell remarquee posters. And a couple of my collector friends have them. And it'd be a little panther at the bottom. And now you have an original, an actual original artwork from Frank Frazetta on the poster. And that's a nice way for Frank to just sit with a cup of coffee and draw a little panther. But he'd just draw that in half an hour. Draw that. And now he's selling that print for a couple of thousand dollars. And off you go. Now you've got high-end prints with remarquees on them. And they're really worth a fortune. Then you have to burn your lino print. <laughs> okay. I don't, we'll know if that's, there. I don't know if that's still the rules today, but that was the yeah. old rule. You have to prove that there are not going to be any more of these prints. Look at this wonderful stuff from, from Frank in his Al, Al Cap years. And let's see who's... Oh, where's Frank's signature? <laughs> There's as much that work as Al Cap did that. He, he did that. that for a decade. Did that for a decade, almost a decade. That's so long. So it gets delivered, <laughs> and there's Al Cap waddling around. No, one more mint. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, him done. that's him done. Yeah. For the and he gets the prime cost of that. You know, he's a millionaire. Al Cap is a millionaire. Yeah. So for him to cut Frank's wage in half was stupid because he could afford not to, and he still did it. And I probably think, yeah. I, I don't know the f entire history, but I'll bet it wasn't long after that when little Abner pulled it. I'll bet you. Because he can't draw like this after 10 years of hiatus. There's no way. Look at the movement. Look at that. Just that one panel. Look at that. There's no way that guy's picking up a pencil after 10 years and bringing this to the table. <laughs> Forget about it. I was <laughs> enough to see this in real life before it disappeared. And it was all correct. So someone's touched this up. So all along here, all along here was oh so brutally correct along this area here with glazes. So know your medium as well. And don't put your paintings in an oven like Frank did. I can break this down. I think I did before because I loved it so yeah. much. But, Sarah but... Frazetta was talking about that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think we're lagging a little bit. Oh, are we? Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I remember Sarah Frazetta talking about how uh, uh, Frank was baking his paintings in the oven. <laughs> that was yes. crazy. It was, <laughs> yeah. It was just a little bit of, just lacking a little bit of knowledge of how oil dries. It does actually dry, but it's, you don't want to do it because you're drying the layer underneath faster than the layer on top, and that's shrinking. And when it shrinks, it grabs mm. the stuff on top and pulls it in, and that's when the crack happens. So the stuff on top has to have more oil in it. And you're just taking that whole process and speeding up the under layer. And it's a disastrous idea, absolutely disastrous. And that's why this painting was so destroyed. But yeah, I'm breaking this down here. If you know how all of this stuff works, you know how this voice box fits in, for instance, uh, around this, yeah, there's so much anatomy in there, you know, that we could spend the whole week just on the face. But it's this digastric plane is often lost on artists because we rarely see up underneath. 
and the comic book artist would, would take it on. So this one here, we always see the digastric plane from a side view. That's just the way it works. But a whole legion of, of artists just do this. So I'll take that out again. They just do that. And then they just do this. And they have no sense of what's underneath there at all. They have no idea of it. And so there's a lot of comic book artists that are just drawing from other comic book artists. And they're not learning how to draw. They're learning how to copy what someone else did. How, how would Frank uh, study anatomy? What, what was his, his technique? He studied Bridgman. And so the whole, once again, you build a myth around yourself too. So it's good to have a big, uh, you know, story with the, be a colorful character helps as well. It doesn't mean you have to be out of character, but they build a myth around Frank. And one of his, the, oh, it was the guy that hired him for the snowman when he was 16. He says, you really got to understand your anatomy now. So here, take these books, Bridgman books he gave him. And Frank drew every page over a weekend or a night or something. And he brought them back the next day. And he says, I've learned my anatomy now. And uh, there you go. The guy says, yeah, right. <laughs> but he, must, he took a lot from it. So that's the power of osmosis. That's why I wrote that recent book. Is if you just draw on top of a master or just copy a master, you're going to imbibe a ton of stuff. But then you got to put it into play. You can't just go, I know, like Frank was ridiculous, and I know my anatomy now. <laughs> He will, he will continue that idea of what he learned in his paintings and refer back to Bridgman. I bet there was well-worn copies of Bridgman in Frank's house after that. Because there's no, well, maybe he has the photographic memory that he says. Some people have. Uh, and if he did, then he learned it like he said he did. And he had that forever. Yeah, there's this a is, lot of mythology around him. Like he was like some kind of super, super person. Like you were saying it earlier. Yeah. Well, that was cool. like uh there's like some story about him like someone wanted to draw a rabbit or something and he's like oh the old williamson story and yeah. he just like stared at the wall or closed his eyes he's like okay i can draw a rabbit now <laughs> the best rabbit you ever saw by the way yeah i mean there might be something to that if you focus on something really hard i bet you can do better at it <laughs> yeah well there is something in that i think the um i think the funny animals with a reason why I could draw a rabbit. Because when you think of rabbits, yeah. it's like another iteration of a, another creature, like a, sk uh, a skunk or something. You know, they all have the same kind of anatomy to them. You know, they're yeah. wide at the side, not at the front like we are. You know, they all have this kind of anatomy to them that is, is similar. And yeah, sometimes you just kind of like draw, get those weird grants. Something that I think helped me out a lot, I'm thinking about, is like we worked at like a children's illustration company. And so it was so random. Is like <laughs> xylophone, zebra, like the whole alphabet of mm -hmm. every single random thing you can imagine. Yeah. You yeah. just kind of start building up a database in your mind yeah, of just random yeah. objects. And you get better at like just smushing stuff together to make it you look know. right. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good point too. Because I think that learning structural shapes is more important than learning anatomy. And the anatomy is vital later when you're oil painting. Like for the shapes here, like I'm always talking about you know, the simple systems I use are, and I give them mnemonic names as well. I go Mr. T. So I get a T shape here and I run it down there. And I go down to the arrow like that. I can build anything off of that because I just go, there's our first landmark there. And then I go, well, the hips are going to come down to here in a bell shape like this. And then we have these two the same. So I can bring this down like that and then build this rib cage into here like that and that'll also give me the lower or the upper ab end like that where the person creases so i know that crease is going to happen there and then i can run this pubic hair across it has to take an angle at this point to get that great trochanter down to here and it'll give us the condyles of the femur so i know that that's going to happen that makes that that femur look very short so i'd probably do a little bit of pentimento up to there so it seems just like a short upper leg there to me but what a fabulous drawing. This is very early. This is it's dated 1970, but this is 1950. Uh, he did that for copyright reasons. And unusual for Frank, because Frank would do a bigger head later in his career. Let's see if we can make this more Frazetta-like. Yeah, I haven't seen this one before. Yeah, this is his first girlfriend, so I don't think it got mm -hmm. on. You know, you're married. And, is that your girlfriend again? You know, I think that was squirreled, <laughs> squirreled away, and she's completely naked. So you, that's not going to work too well with, with your uh, new spouse. So yeah, this was Frank's first girlfriend. And 
their their family didn't like Frank. He was too rough. I think is this the one that like uh, they wrote on the Frazetta the Frazetta girls Instagram about like uh, when she broke up with them, he took it back or something. There was like a painting he did for a girl oh, right. who rejected him, and he took it back. It's so, <laughs> like so many okay. stories. I bet yeah. so it must be. It must be. Yeah, he's like, well, yeah, it's taking agency. <laughs> yeah, that's that's more agency. But look, here's what I've done. I've made the head bigger to show where I think Frank evolved into next where he would make more realistic figures so he was going for eight heads high there maybe even 10 to make her just monumental but i like that better because it it feels more like the later frank frazettas and i love the early frank frazettas i love them all that really I like feels the watercolors i like all the little stuff in the corner like all that stuff going on in the front there there's a yeah. lot it's a well, this frog is, yeah well this Butterflies. is from this funny animals yeah this is this funny animals world yeah Look how much it taught him <laughs> It taught him to do all this wiggly stuff. A lot well, going on. There's a lot going on. And now he can do this. He can get into these, this world of realism and have all of that dynamic stuff that you can only get from drawing and drawing all the time. Come the dawn. And you can see he's working commercially there because, look, he's got a grid system going. This is for the letterer to put the letter on straight, the comic book. And so they'll, they'll paste it down. You know when you do cut and paste in Photoshop? This is where it comes from. He used to cut pieces of paper and paste them down as letters. Look how <laughs> hard words. There's words. Look how hard the words. Completely different now. Yeah. <laughs> and keep this straight. You no, know, that had to be a ninety degree, degree angle here. So all of that stuff had to be done. But the beauty of that, oh my world. Look how beautiful. Here's an example of why AI AI art is not going to win the game because you cannot. I hope anyway. Get the beauty <laughs> of this simplicity here. That Frank has that is hard down to the absolute essence of everything the movement in these trees look at that and here's where I first broke rank from academic rigor when people started doing you have to do these little tasks where you cross hatch everything and that was the first thing that really stuck in my craw cross hatching it should just be for me anyway a secondary moment where a lot of lines cross. See, I think this is the weakest part of that picture, mm. where we actually see the cross hatching because it flattens the form. Now look how beautiful this is. I can really feel the the weight of that and the maybe the wetness of it, you know, that dankness. And then look here, how that really feels like it's blowing into the breeze, just gorgeous. And all of this, just the energy of it, just even these stray ones, just for the fun, just absolutely beautiful. So follow the form. Yeah, I don't think AI is doing that. It can't. It can't follow the form. It doesn't know what yeah. form is. No, it does. Like, uh, I, I don't think. Like, I, I feel like, like, um, whatever imagination and creativity is, I don't. I think it's a very human thing. Like, yes. I, I think that's one of those things that's going to be more special. I think AI takes everything and reflects it back at us. Yeah. But it doesn't have that thing behind it that a human does. Yeah, and it never will. It, it never will because we know it's Yeah, there. I think that's a human thing. I think mm -hmm. it's... Yeah. I, I just think it's different. <laughs> yeah, it's not even intelligence. It's all other... Yeah, it's just... Yeah, it's just reflecting stuff back. It is. It's, it's just reflecting stuff back at us right now. Yeah. And it is very smart and intelligent, but yeah. it, it doesn't have that same thing in it. Well, it has smart, intelligent data to draw from, but it, it itself has no intelligence. It doesn't understand anything. So it's just grabbing. Yeah. It's, just... it's not cleaning up the, the, sorry, it's lagging a little bit. Yeah. It's synapses. It's like synapses in the brain. It's just grabbing things that are already there and pulling them in. What were you going to say, Rachel, before mm -hmm. you lagged? I was just, uh, sorry, it's like lagging a little bit tonight. I don't know why. Um, because I'm recording. But yeah, it's not, I was, I was going to say, it's not, you know, cleaning up at the grocery store and getting rained on going home. Like, <laughs> having human experience. Yeah, it's, you're not, it's not building character <laughs> like that. Yeah. Well, here's what really stunned me that, that you brought that point up. I am shocked that Frank never left, never left America. He never left America. And yet when I look at some of his paintings, I go, wow, that reminds me of Petra and Jordan. That I could smell mm. the, the musky heat of the sand being you know, dried out from the, the rains. I can really feel everything of this in Frank's work. And he never left America. I, I am shocked by that. I really am. 
because that's usually what builds mm. the catalog you need to really get authenticity into your picture is to really sense it you know feel it and go out and do it i guess in pennsylvania you've got all the seasons so you can do it in a, a, a way but I, that always surprised me and i thought he would be the kind of person that would be want that would want that adventure but he was a homebody so there's a conundrum there right there but look at this yeah where we are now in the 70s this is him in his prime for me and there was many primes the primes in the 50s were incredible but here we have it all you know he's learned his anatomy you know we're talking about breaking these things down you can really sense that head in there you can really feel that nuchal ridge on the on the helmet and if you don't know that stuff it's very hard to draw a helmet if you don't know how to place it on the on the skull like that and then in and out you go with all this stuff pretty easy but it really takes you to know even the simple i would advise anyone to just take any picture photographer frank frazetta here and ask yourself what are the contours you know where is that arm is that arm coming toward us then do that and look how easy you can put a bangle on there right the minute you know which way it's going that's going that way you can put this armor on like that it's such a simple thing and you'd be shocked at how many people can can place something on a system and make it look authentic because they don't understand the contour they don't understand on this 2d image and just copy in is not enough you know if you learn all your style from copying another artist verbatim without learning how to draw anatomy or how to divide the shapes up like that artist that you're copying did you're never going to be anywhere close to that caliber so i would say to everyone you know learn from frank frazetta have a look at, at play the contour game for instance and then ask yourself what's this what in the hell is that it's the biceps femoris attaching right onto the little ball of the fibula that's exactly what it is that's a tendon and there's two tendons in there there's biceps femoris short head as well but that's one little bit of anatomy and then over here we have the semitendinosus and membranous. Now listen to that. That's a load of old nonsense, right? They're just silly names, but they are shapes. And if you have enough love for this thing, you maybe go and learn that stuff, even though it's not that important. Now here's a thing here. Now why does that ring not not equate to what's going on in that calf? Well, things slip as well. So you can get into a, a system where you go, oh right, I'll always fit that on. Well, what if you put a chain on and it slips, and then it has to do something else? So gravity, you have to make sure that you're not just running like a robot and you're asking yourself, well, what if, what if, why is he up here? He's obviously not there. This is the fighting men of Mars, the chess men of Mars, this is called, I think, where the gravity in Mars is less. And so they actually can jump higher. And that's what he's doing there. He's, he's elevated. Beautiful, really beautiful. Just gorgeous. And making some anatomy up there. I'm not sure what's going on there. No, we've got the vastus lateralis there. But this extra little bit, just for rhythm. You know, he knows his anatomy. There's the sartorius right there. He's got his adductors going on. And then you've got your biceps, semitenosis and membranous, which is this stuff over here. See that from another angle. Now, look how dedicated he was to understanding all that stuff. It's no wonder that he can just add all this stuff on top. Because it just flows around the anatomy. It just flows all around. Just beautiful. And these little moments here where you just break it up. You don't, don't join every line. Look how he's just broke it up with these little darks in there. Leave a little bit to the imagination. The line weight. This is a masterpiece. Every one of them is. Every one of Frank's, you know, Canaveral Press works and Chessmen of Mars. That book, I would love to have got that novel. Because all of those pictures are in there. Anyway, I talk too much. So any questions, guys? We'll wrap it up in a little bit. Uh, at the moment. Yeah, no more questions. No? Yeah. Well, let's have a look at Johnny Comet. So here's what, what Frank was doing. He finally got himself a newspaper strip, a syndicate strip. And probably this is where he was making his money. But it was in collaboration with someone else, so they were probably taking most of it. You know, the writer. The writer always gets paid the most, no matter whether you like it or not. It's just the way it goes. Now, they didn't like a story about a guy that, that rides racing cars. Too many racing cars. They want these girls. They want these sexy girls in here. So they changed it halfway through to Ace McCoy. And that must have been a real 
bell ringer for Frank. He must go. They've changed the title. Somebody is fearful. You don't change a brand, especially midway through. So they must have been already signing the, the death keel for this. Ace McCoy. So he finally got it. And this is the moment where I think he was bitter. So let's find Thunder and see why a man would take agency and why a little bit of pain hurts, but it helps. I can find Thunder. I think we saw him further, further back here. This was a dirty move. And when we talk about goodwill, this was a dirty move back here. Let's see it, Thunder. So Frank ruffled a few feathers. And this is what you're going to do when you find agents. You're going to ruffle feathers. There's no doubt about that. He ruffled Hugh Hefner's feathers there with little Fanny Annie. So they wanted little Fanny Annie for a Christmas edition or something. And Frank was the best at drawing, you know, sexy girls. And they brought in Frank to do little Fanny Annie. And everyone went berserk for that because it had mold into it. And it looked realistic, even though it was a cartoon. There's only few people can do that. Hugh Hefner never liked it. He says, I don't like it. She looks too realistic. Never liked it. But he was a businessman. The public loved it. So he's ruffling feathers there. Look at this beautiful stuff here. Back from the 50s. Two peaks. That's a cool one. Isn't that fantastic? He would draw the ballerinas. You want to draw live people? Go draw the ballerinas. I take my students down from the animation department down to the ballerina department over in the university here. Fantastic university. And we draw the ballerinas. And they're fantastic. Even when they're standing, I often say, when they're standing talk, waiting for a coffee, that's how they stand. So I just go, is that a bunch of ballerinas? They don't need to be mm -hmm. in the costumes. That's how they stand. They're always fluid. Ballerinas are amazing to draw. So just off case a bit there. But here's the last comic book he did. And he wanted to go out in a buying. This was called The Werewolf. And it was for Warren. And they were paying so poorly that he went into the movie business posters and made a fortune. And then got very bored very quickly. Because he was getting art directed again. So... We get a bit of love from Frank here. He's doing what he loves. And then we get a little bit of commerce. And then he comes back again. We all do. We all come back for the love of it. And if you don't, you will burn right out. I like that shark girl one. Yeah, that's a weird one. that Because it's there's a few that aren't Frank Frazetta to me. I never saw that as Frank Frazetta. That yeah. looks to me like another artist that was very popular. Yeah, I would not have known that. Yeah, I would have called that it's a cool. Friend. It is cool. I would have called this a Fergal Finley. If I move this across, that's starting to feel like Frank Frazetta. So once he stops being Frank Frazetta, he loses a lot of power, I think. You know, look at that. My word, that is gorgeous. From the Canar Canaveral Press era, I think. I'm trying to find thunder because this is the end of the discussion about agency and why we need it. There it is there. Thunder. All right. So Frank's in his 20s, and he produces this comic book, right? But he ruffles feathers. The guy at the top doesn't like him. He doesn't like the way he has agency. So there's the danger with agency. When I say to you, no art direction, make sure you don't need art direction. Because if you say, I don't take art direction, and you need art direction, that's arrogance. You know, When you're in your 20s, you need art direction, unless you're some prodigy. So here's the prodigy. <laughs> Frank in his 20s, ruffling feathers. Right? And he creates this whole comic strip, Thunder. And he doesn't sign the contract like he should. Right? So now they own the world rights to Thunder. Frank walks away from Thunder, disgruntled by the management. And underneath his feet, they sell Thunder to Columbia Pictures, I believe. And they make a serialized movie franchise out of Thunder. Long forgotten. But that's what they did. And at the time, now this is Frank in his 20s, he would have been the equivalent of a millionaire today. Because Hal Foster was. Hal Foster sold the rights to, to Prince Valiant to a movie studio. And he was much older than Frank. But he's smart. You know, he's smart. And Frank was smart. Frank was a genius. But he was smart in business. You know, he had the years behind him. You know, he probably 60 or something when he signed the contract for Prince Valiant. Frank's in his 20s, still learning. We all get ripped off. Mm -hmm. So Hal Foster sees the movie, 
You know, he sees how this is coming along and he goes, I'll take a flat fee, thanks. I won't take, which would be a smarter move, a percentage of the profits, which was offered to him. So I'll take the flat, flat fee, thank you. And so they give him a flat fee of, I think it was, let me see if I can find it. Anyway, I, I asked a, a converter. There's an American converter of money. And the conversion today is a, a half a million dollars. So he made a half a million dollars in his money to basically just say, okay, you can take my idea of Prince Valiant and make a movie out of it. And he went to the premiere, made, met Janet Lee and, and uh, Robert Wagner and all, you know, it was in the newspapers. What a wonderful life. Back in the 1940s and 50s, artists were superstars. Illustrators were superstars. That's what Frank would have probably gotten for Thunder. Or maybe less, because Thunder wasn't, you know, wasn't as big a, you know, it didn't have all that behind it. So let's say they offered Frank the equivalent of thirty thousand dollars or something. I do believe that Frank bought his house for seven or seventeen back then. Whatever mm -hmm. money he would have got, lowest pay for that Columbia Pictures would have made Frank very wealthy, and he didn't get it. So that would have made him bitter forever. Frank, Frank seemed to like understand he had value. He did. Which, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Let's make that before we leave this. Everybody's motto. You have value. If someone calls you, That's they, didn't cool just stick a, they didn't just stick a pin in a telephone directory and you got pinned. They called you because they think you can do the job, right? You have value. Now, if you, if you think the deal's not very good, and it's going to hurt you forever like a dead Frank, ask for more. You know, if you can afford to, if you have to pay the rent like I did, then you have to take the deal. But you can always ask. And so I always asked, even if I didn't think I could, you know, I always asked. Right. So I said, so whatever they offered me, I said, can you make it more? You know, so if someone mm -hmm. offered me 500, I'd say, can you make it 550? We have a deal. <laughs> they always give you it. So why not yeah. have 550? Right. Yeah. And also, here's my another part of my agency that saw another person go out of business. Very simple. They always ask for sketches, little thumbnails. And I said, well, because I had done so many jobs where I do all these thumbnails and then they would cancel the job. Now, when I got an agent, she was smarter than that. She'd say, there's a kill fee. If you kill this job, you need to pay us 30%. Now, when they're calling people that aren't in agencies, that's, the, that's one of the reasons why they're calling them. Because they might be going, let's get some ideas out of this artist. Because if we go to the agency, they'll want to kill a fee. And they did that to a friend of mine. They were always asking him for ideas, and then he always canceled the job, and he had no kill fee. So it's hard to ask for a kill fee because they go, yeah. right, oh, this guy, he's on to us. But what I used to do is I say, the thumbnails cost $30 each, and we can take that off the end of the price if the job goes ahead. That was my idea of a kill fee where no one gets hurt. Yeah. So they would go for that. And I said, now, if we get three thumbnails and you go for four and five and six, then you have to pay the extra and it doesn't come off the end. That was my, this is my own little business brain going. Yeah, that's a good pay. idea. Yeah. And so they went, okay. Like so, a security department. Yeah. yeah. So, so they went, so that's fair. We get three goes at this. And then if there's another one, you get an extra $30 at, at the end. Yeah. And right away, they get clarity of thought. They go, okay, let's pick one of these three because it's free. Yeah. It's yeah, because it continues. Yeah. What, so I'm trying is just like, you know, I'll do the concept art for free and then I'm asking for money. Yeah. It's already becoming an issue. It's yeah, like, so, yeah. Charge for the concepts. So let's say they, okay. kill, let's say they kill the job and I've done three thumbnails. Three, six, nine, that's $90. It's not much money, but it didn't hurt because I got $90. You know, I've got $90. And uh, that, that was before tea break in the morning because I do them that fast. There you go. There's three. And nobody will ever shirk at $30. They'll never shirk. Now that's way back. I would charge $60 now, right? Maybe maybe 50. Let's say I'd charge 50. Nobody's going to shirk at that. And this guy went out of business because he never got a kill fee and he never got paid for his, his concepts. He never got paid. Now, I'll have a look at Frank here. Now, he's talking about, just so everyone can breathe a little bit easier, he did use reference. He's not out there taking a photograph because he looks good with a gun. 
if we go back into here it is a cool picture yeah, it's a really cool picture it's a really yeah. cool picture see if you can use your fast brain to see clint eastwood's gauntlet poster and see if you can see the werewolf too so we have two instances instances i'm not actually trying to debunk frank here i just want everyone to know that he was human and it makes yeah. me more impressive to me because it wasn't some oh he didn't even try you know, like for instance, look at Frank here standing beside the bed. That's a huge error right there. And once mm -hmm. again, I'm not I'm not saying anything derogatory mm -hmm. to him here working for money. That bed would have to be hugely high for your for the cut you off half halfway through your body. What kind of bed's that? That's bizarre. And that is not Frank's fault. The art director has said we need to fit a figure in there. And I'll bet you Frank says, Well, how high is this bed? So it doesn't matter, just make sure he fits into that square format. That's all it is. And you used to get that from art directors all the time. And that's why perspectives are so poor on book jackets. Because the art directors always say, make sure you fit all the figures in. So I do want to find that gauntlet picture. To see why I think art direction kills so much of work. And big shout out to all the art directors. They made me a better artist through, through my life. Uh, just It's a part of agency that came later for me and for Frank as well. It made the art better. It just did. And it took the pressure off them too, because they don't have to worry anymore about having the art direct. That's already in the bag. Oh, I want to find the gauntlet. There's the, the big picture that made him a fortune right there in his own lifetime anyway. That one gave him total freedom. Quarter of a million dollars for that drawing. And remember now, it's just the same as me with that big poster. Frank drew this not long after Everyone said he was old fashioned. Uh, just a, a couple of years later, he was doing this after Al Cap sacked him. He did this. So being sacked by Al Cap was one of the best things that ever happened to him. So always ask yourself, how can I benefit from this bad luck? What can I do now? And that's what he did. He says, I'm going to really make sure nobody ever rips me off again. And also, I'm going to make sure that my work is worth so much that I can sell it as an original. Because he did uh, confess to doing bad work when he was badly paid. It's hard not to. <clears throat> Here's Bloodstone. One of the reasons I took a job was because it was Bloodstone reprinted. And I went, I'll do it because Frank did. That's just a <clears throat> bad book. So I painted <clears throat> Bloodstone. I have that. Let me see if I can find it, actually. Let's have a quick look in here. We might find the gauntlet in here, too. No, oh, that's wrong. Photos. Photos look one of my favorites here. And Mike Mignola the artist is often cited as you know because he's a comic book artist these blacks are what often people say is where he learned how to draw comic books was from frank's paintings not actually his his comic books themselves so you can see how much bigger i paint than frank as well frank pa painted very very small compared to me so we all have our aesthetics and yeah i wanted to go in here and find my bloodstone to show just how the lineage works and how, how grateful I am that Frank existed. Here I am here. There's my bloodstone in the background. Do you see it? Yeah. I, I paint, look at the size of it. And here's another in, uh, frontispiece from Bloodstone. So I painted them only because Frank had painted. No other reason. <laughs> I, I like the art director. The art director is wonderful and everything. And you know I own the originals and on and on. Benefiting from everything that Frank has done before to paint that huge big picture and sell it in our collector and have the rights to it and on and on and on all based on you know that agency that frank gave us i always i have to always bring this up because i just have to jim steranko i just have to look at the power play of that arm look at my shoulder down look at the grip yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, there it's a full power play there's me with wonderful alana get yourself a great model you know it's, it's everything it really is. What was I trying to do? Yeah, trying to find that actual thing. You know, and be bold. You know, the reason why I was so su successful at this event, I reckon, was my, look how small everyone else's paintings are. They're very successful artists. But I didn't have that many paintings in my aura to fill a wall. And so I did big paintings. And that was just a thought. It was a thought, how can I possibly, I can't go in there like Omar, who has a ton of work behind him and fill that in four months. 
I had to do it by doing big paintings. So you get, it can always be done. You just got to get the agency. Go, how can I do this? There's a way. Yeah, it seems like a lot of it's, it's, it's mindset. Like you get stuck in a mindset like, oh, when am I going to catch a break? Nothing works That's out. Right. And then my stuff sucks. I know. Or whatever. For whatever reason, it's you can come up with all these excuses in your head to yeah. why it's not going to work. It's so, like you just get like, that's exhausting to be around. You're, you're not going to go anywhere that way. You got to be the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. Be like, this I is a problem. <laughs> How can I do something with this? <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what? There's an old saying in teaching. You know, I teach, obviously. It's if you say you can't do something, you can't do it. You've, yeah. already, you've already, you've written your own contract. If you said this yeah. is impossible, then it is impossible. Yeah, every time you I, say you can't, you should just catch yourself. <laughs> you should. Just say you yeah. can't. I, I did it once very long ago. I remember saying to one of my agents, they said, because I had the agency to, of having an agent and my own clients. So I had two things going on at once. And I was talking to the agent. They were clear. I was always very upfront with everyone. And so I said, oh, I've, I've so much work. And I had to turn one of those jobs away. And she said to me, you never turn work away. I says, I had to. I didn't have the time. She says, there's always time. Now, she's tough. She's tough. But she was kind of right. If you turn something down, you close the door. And this, the echo of that door is astoundingly loud. So yeah. if you can say, I'm really busy and I would love to do this job. Please call me back on the next one. I'd love to do business with you. That's not the door closed, but you have successfully yeah. avoided that pressure and still kept the door open. But the minute you say no, that door closes. You're the guy yeah. that says no. So don't say no. Say, change that. Don't say can't. You can. You can always do it. People always say to me, how long yeah. is it a painting? Well, what's the deadline? Is it 12 hours or 12 days? It's 12 hours. It'll be done in 12 hours. Is it 12 days? Yeah. It'll be done in 12 days. It's always the same. But you have to be good. I, I think we do have our limits, but you don't find those until you you reach yeah. them. <laughs> if you can't and, do it. You know, when you reach them, you can yeah. get, yeah, you can get like higher and higher on that too. Yeah. Like, to, as far as how much work you can take yeah. on and, yeah. and you learn from failure more than you learn from not doing it. You yeah do. you definitely learn more from failure <laughs> here <laughs> let's a rewind a bit if you can't do it don't take the job if you can't do it oh, yeah. if you're saying no because of the pressure because you know it's going to be pressure what i'm saying is i know it's going to be pressure because i can do it but it's going to be pressure that's the only reason i'm saying no because it's pressure if it's a definite i can't do this i'm not taking the job there's nothing worse than failing on the job. My agent had me working on the clock because I never missed a deadline. Well, I missed one at the very start of my career. And that little bit of pain, I never missed another deadline. So I wouldn't take a job unless I could complete it. So I was the deadline guy, wasn't I? He can do it. Patrick will do it. You know, my agent was tough as hell. Somebody failed on a job. Yeah, hold on a second. He'd do that. I go, no, no. He'd go, can you finish this job? This guy can't do it. <laughs> or this guy hasn't got the job in on time. Uh, they, you know, this guy's had a week to do a job and he's called up and said, I can't do it. Oh, yeah. And they're going, Patrick, you've got two days to do it now because this guy has a week and he's blowing it. So I could have had a week and two days and now I've got two days <clears throat> to do the job. So I'm always working on the clock. So I'm exhausted and the phone rings at four in the morning. I think, who rings at four in the morning? Right? You know who rings at four in the morning? A coward. So this guy's rung at four in the morning because he wants to leave an answer on the answer machine. He doesn't want to talk to the agent. And the answer is, I can't do this job. It's been too, it's been too stressful. I'm out. The job's due tomorrow or the day after. And I went, you can't do that, pal. And the agent came in at about eight o'clock whistling. Do, 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 and he goes, uh, any messages? <laughs> he says, there's one there. I'd get a coffee first. And you should have heard. You should have heard. I have never heard so much continuous swear words and so colorfully put together. <laughs> and the swear words, everyone, think of all the swear words that have ever been uttered in the world. He got them all out. He Just leave him a room alone for a minute. This was the, the, the color of the room is now purple. And I went, I have never heard swearing like that in my life. And he ended it with two big ones at the end two big c's let's call them the big c's at the end just like that with no words in between 
Slam the phone down. He says, Patrick, yeah. two... Patrick, we have two days to do this job. That's what he said. So make sure you can do the job. Now, I wanted to end the <laughs> podcast on this artwork because I thought the first artwork I ever saw was Frank Frazetta's Egyptian Queen. And it wasn't. It was this one. And it was on the cover of, I think, either Eerie or Creepy. And it's 1966. Now, I wouldn't have seen it in 1966. That would have been way too Fishes. I was very lucky. Fishes. I was, <laughs> yeah, there's always something of the love in Frank's work. I we had I was so lucky. We had the reprints of Warren and the reprints of Marvel's Jack Kirby run at the same time when I was a teenager, way after the 60s when they were made. I got it all at once. I was so lucky. And I saw this one first and didn't know it was Frank Fazetta. I had no idea at all. So this is the first thing I ever saw. And it just filled me with awe. And it was mostly this, this push of anatomy. So it looks like I loved anatomy way before I knew what anatomy was. Push of it. You can only get this from drawing, not from academia, because nobody pushes their limbs like this. So if you are only studying in an academic class and you're painting from live models and you're sight sizing the whole thing, you will never paint like Frank Fazetta. That's an impossibility. You have to be able to draw like that. And there is the agency. And there is the path. And if we say, my life's so tough, it's always going to be tough for an artist. Always. But it's those little moments where you ha you're pushed in the corners and you have to navigate these things, like me and greeting cards and animation and all kinds of things. And then you've come out the other end with a ton of stuff that I always think of my career as flotsam and jetsam. Things hit me and I go, oh, that's interesting. I'll do that. Oh, that, oh, what was that? Oh, funny figures. I'll do them. And then you come out the other end, you've got this incredible sort of aura of many styles that you can imbibe from and come out with something totally unique. Whereas if you're only in one studio, learning one method, you're going to be like the guy right next to you in the same studio and the next guy and the next guy and on and on all the way around. And you're never going to be Frank Rosetta and you're never going to be you unless you start changing things. How can I take what I've learned in this academia, which is a great thing to, to learn. I've learned all of the anatomy and everything. Now, what can I spin on that? What can I, can I take some comic book and put it in? Can I take some exaggeration of, which I like to do, of pushing the form and the anatomy? And can I change the color scheme to my choice? Franks were all analogous colors. That's what I use. And everyone else was doing bombastic colors. And every other artist was trying to do brighter colors because the other guy did the bright color. Now he's doing day glow colors. And it's just, I can't look at it anymore. It's just too much. And what's in the middle there? This beautiful, serene, analogous painting by Frank Fazetta. And now you walk toward that. So you're doing the opposite. You're doing the opposite of everyone else. All right, guys, we could do 100 Frank Frazetta. Honestly, we could. <laughs> Is there any last uh, questions in there? There's one here. Uh... It says, uh, hey, Patrick, it's Pe Pedro. Uh, I heard hey, that Pedro. Frazetta used poor materials. Is that true? Yes, it is. It's very true. And that's yeah. the reason why his paintings are cracking to this day. So don't use poor materials. So there's, there's a great lesson there. And it's great to build a myth. So we built this amazing myth around Frank. And some of that myth was bad advice. You know, if we go oh, use Mickey Mouse paints, well, you get Mickey Mouse longevity out of those paints. Not so much of the Mickey Mouse ones. You know, watercolor lasts. But oils don't. Not if you yeah. There's like materials. dried watercolors that's for children that yes. has like just the primary colors. Yeah, he was yep. using those. On yep. some of those. I would say, and you know what? <laughs> you know, some of those Mickey Mouse watercolors. Once you get into the reds, they fade like crazy. Once you get into the blues, it's about light fastness. They fade like crazy. Then you've got, and you know, there's one of the reasons why oils are revered because they they do yellow, but they don't really fade. You put them in the sun and they'll do all kinds of things, but mostly they'll just go yellow. That's what'll ha happen with it. It's in here. So my advice is, you know, I want to bring some up we haven't seen before, or usually don't see anyway. I, I would that. say that cheap art materials are a false economy because they thin it down with so, so, you know, like a tin of beans. You get a tin of beans by Heinz and you get a tin of beans by Glory Beans. And you go, wow, this is half price. And you open the glory beans and half a tin of tomato sauce fall, falls out onto your plate and four beans at the end. And you open up the Heinz. Boy, I should ask them, add some tomato sauce to this because these beans are so dense. So 
you know, oil and watercolor paints are like that. If you get really great watercolor and really great oil paints, you can thin them right down with all the mediums to the point where it just seems to got tubes that are going to outlive me. There's no doubt about it. But those little, uh, they're usually called student colors. You know, they're light fast. And the and you, once again, you, you we've all done it. A cheap tube of paint, you squeeze it, oil runs out for ages. And then the paint mm -hmm. starts to come out. You know, you're paying yeah. for the oil. You're not paying, paying for the pigment that people have mined from the bottom of the ocean. You're paying for oil that's only pulled out of a tree or wherever they get it from olives. You know, you got, that's what you're paying for, the cheap stuff. And so you get the cheap stuff. Don't buy cheap. Unless there's always a caveat. You're really just learning. I mean, you're at the very start and you're really learning. Once you get a commission, go get yourself some good paints. That's my advice. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> All right. Well, let's. I think that's us now. Is there, are there any last questions? Uh, there's a there's a comment. There's a um. Com yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Shrubham <laughs> says, "Hey, Patrick, just wanted to tell you, thank you. Uh, you're awesome. Just the best. Love thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. I love doing this. I'm supposed to be working." You know, I'm supposed to be doing something else. I got a, I got a chapter of a book to write today. <laughs> I got to do that. And we'll say goodbye to everyone that, that tuned in, guys. We really appreciate you coming here. Uh, like I said, if you want to grow your agency as an artist, and, you know, let's make sure that we're getting that right. Because an agency is usually uh, someone in a, a building with a whole bunch of employees. I mean the word agency where you're in charge. If you want to, want to really take a hold of your future and learn art along the way and you know, ask questions along the way from the likes of us that have been doing this a long time. And you'll get two perspectives. You'll get one from me that I've been in the business forever. And then you've got Melanie and Rachel there and they're in the, the <laughs> boiling pot right now. Yeah. So they're getting the, the slings and arrows that are really useful for you today because I'm really not dealing so much with the beginning of a career anymore. And so the landscape is definitely changing. It always does. So I'm learning from Rachel and Melanie what's going on out there. You know, I'm learning along with you guys. So tune in, get the best of both worlds, and I'll say slauncher from me and from the Virginians. See y'all next time. <laughs>